Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may happen to be, and whether you're watching live or archived, and welcome to the May editions of Not Tells Transmission Talk Tuesdays. I'm your host, Jeff Welton, and I can't believe I got through the name all again. We are coming up on the one-year anniversary of these, and it's really gratifying to see so many of you still coming by. This one, of course, we're talking about grounding and lightning protection, so it's a topic everybody likes. As you know, when you register, you've got the option to uh, put in any advanced questions, and uh, I'll just flip this up in front of the camera. A lot of you did just that. Uh, we will try, that's me going old school with the print material there, but we will try to uh, address those as we go through today. As you know, I've got my uh, guest, my uh, buddy, Alex Hartman. Uh, Alex wears many, many hats, but today we're going to uh, pick on him for both his uh, Nautel customer service tech apparel and his experience as a field service, well, field engineer doing contract work. I was torn so, this morning. Should I put the blue one on or the orange one? There you go. Now, I'd see what you need to do is uh, draw a little line down the middle and just sew two of them together. You can do a little Harlequin style outfit. Right. So. Folks, I want to thank you all for joining in. As always, we've got the little preamble with the uh, housekeeping stuff. Uh, when you uh, look at your little control panel, there's a place where you can type questions. One or two folks have availed themselves of that already. By all means, type your questions in as you think of them. If I think of a place where they'll fit, I'll address them when they fit. Otherwise, I'll uh, deal with them whenever I possibly can. David Creel makes the comment that uh, blue and orange would be great colors for an Auburn grad. So War Eagle, there you go. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm not going to make a roll tide comment, but there we go. Anyway, <laughs> that said, we also invite you to uh, participate in these. Uh, you've got a little hand wavy icon on your control interface. If you click that, then I will try to unmute you and uh, bring you into the conversation ask you to be polite but uh anybody is welcome and uh dissenting opinions are always entertained uh remember if you are an spe member that uh completion of one of our webinars is uh good for half of a credit toward your recertification assuming you're certified if you aren't certified why not heck if i can do it anybody can do it it's it's, it's spe certification so simple a sales guy can do it anyway that said we will get rolling. Uh, we've got a bunch of stuff to uh, cover and we're going to start pretty quickly. Uh, I left in the agenda, this is a lot of this is a recap of one we did last year. The good thing is because the slides don't have a whole lot of material on them, they're there for background. Alex and I provide all the color commentary and uh, we get to go whichever direction we want to. So uh, these are where we're kind of looking at talking about and we'll see where it goes from there uh, somebody says that alex's shirt is well grounded just saying thanks lloyd uh, mm -hmm. Al alex is well grounded in general um bill has uh made a good good comment uh, and bill uh if if you've got a microphone i may un unmute you in a little bit because uh if you're building a new site that'd be a great conversation to have for a bit of a case study uh, if you don't have a microphone, that's fine too, but uh, we'll, we'll deal with that. So this one, when we did this session last year, Elaine Jones, uh, who does a lot of PR stuff for us, had, had sent me this picture that she'd taken, and uh, she's down in some hot place in the desert, Tucson, I believe. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it. Uh, this is uh, the kind of stuff that they deal with down there. So we're going to talk about that. And the big thing that we always talk about is grounding. And Bill has a microphone, so I am going to unmute Bill right now. And uh, Bill, you were talking about uh, having a new site coming up. You'll have to unmute yourself there. Uh, just, yep, there, there you're you good. Go. Perfect. So uh, you, you've got a new site coming up, no concrete poured at all. Well, right. We've got our uh, a VS 2.5 at a current on our at our site that we built 10 years ago, um, and uh, the property owner there is is wanting us to move, and we've got a new site identified. Um, so we're just really in the initial stages of planning, and and I'd really at this point I'd like to to you know include grounding of the building, grounding of the tower, grounding of you know. Uh, the power coming into the into the building, all that. Back in the bad old days, I used to work for 
for the telephone company. Of course, they took grounding to a, a to an art, yeah. uh, and I'm not sure not sure that the, all that's necessary. But uh, you know, whatever whatever recommendations you have or recommendations for for further reading would be uh, appreciated. Well, so two great resources. Uh, obviously, I'm going to plug ours first. But if you go to our website under uh, resources and white papers, and then scroll all the way down to the bottom, there's a site care tab. And if you click on that, you'll see um, two, one preparing a, a new transmitter facility, and one on uh, our, our traditional grounding and lightning protection. Look at the new facility paper. That'll help you out a lot. Um, of course, if you've got telco experience, you're familiar with the Motorola R56 standard, and that's another great resource. Uh, you can download that to anywhere with Google. Yeah, what I tell people about the R56 is they take it to almost to a fault, and remember that you know telco and two-way is not always the same as broadcast. So you don't have to go to their extent, but it's you can get almost all the way there on that same document would well, be pretty safe. So the, and, and I tell people that the R56 standard also involves the halos and I love them and hate them. I love them because they give you an excellent grounding system when they're properly done. I hate them because they give you a terrible grounding system when they're improperly done. And I've seen them both ways. Yep. Um, so there's, uh, James, there's a lot so, of, of thermite uh, flashing around uh, when oh, that's yeah. being done properly. Oh, let's see, I'm a big fan of CAD welding. Getting to blow stuff up on purpose is never a bad thing. So, uh, yeah, right. we will. And in the advanced questions, and that that's a good thing to bring up, Bill, one of the things you had mentioned was uh, the concrete pad under the tower and should the rebar and the concrete be bonded. And uh, talk to the folks doing your, your, your concrete work about a UFER ground. Um, and that's literally what it is. The concrete is bonded together and bonded into the ground system. Uh, Two big benefits to that, it can, they claim, help to uh, reduce spalling of the concrete in the event of a strike where you pass a lot of current through the concrete. And it uh, it can also assist you with uh, providing a better ground conductivity. So, you know, definitely that's something else to look at. Yep. Thank you. All right. My pleasure. Now, moving on. I've got past Elaine's picture. Uh, greeting from Ecuador. Well, Alan, it's uh, very glad to see you and uh, welcome. Uh, it's been a little while since I've been down that way. Of course, with COVID these days, it's been a little while since I've been anyway outside of my own county. Uh, now, Mark Boris makes a comment that he's seen concrete bases blown apart from a lightning strike. And that is one of the things that I tell folks. If you've got uh, guy wire anchors, for example, in concrete piers, then it's a really good idea to have a sacrificial safety ground on the guy wire to a ground rod because, uh, yeah, concrete's 50% moisture. And when you run a lot of current through something with a lot of moisture, all that moisture turns to steam, steam expands, bad things happen, boom. I believe that's yeah. actually part of uh, tower uh, standards as well that you because of that you know you always have the the ground on the uh on the anchor point either depending on your soil too you may right. need a sacrificial anode and stuff like that too to help it go along or a chemical mm -hmm. ground if you're in the really you know high mountain desert stuff yeah and this is one of those and as we get through here you're going to see a lot of pictures and uh Let's see, here is another comment. You all, this is going to be one of these days where you, where you guys throw the comments at me faster and I can keep up. So I'll do the best I can, but if we miss any, we will cover them in email. Uh, James Maleshko mentions he was hit by uh, lightning in, two, in uh, Tucson once. So Elaine, keep your head down if you're walking outdoors on a cloudy day. Uh, now, one of the things, and, and here's a good point, and we'll get to it in a, in a bit too. Uh, Alex just shot a note about quarter wave stubs and uh, gas discharge. I've uh, got a yep. couple of comments in there as well. Yep. Um, so this comes back to talking about the R56 standard, and uh, we really focus on single point grounding and uh, having everything... Uh, everything tied together and uh, you can have too many grounds uh, and I know you and I've talked about this once or mm -hmm. twice over the years as uh, as you um, 
as you've been around, like I say, doing contract work. So, uh, yep. you know, how, how do you deal with something where you're moving a piece of gear into an existing site or taking over an existing site as a contract guy? How, how do you get your head wrapped around what goes where? Well, if, uh, use your eyes, um, sometimes your hands, uh, you know, study everything. What I do when I walk into a new site that you know, either I'm taking over or, you know, I've been hired to go, you know, install something new or move something into. Um, first thing I do is put my hands in my pockets. And, and then I start looking around the facility, not necessarily what I'm doing there, but I need to know what I'm getting into. Literally the building, the tower, so on and so forth. So first thing I look for is where's the rods? Where are they coming into the building? How are they bonded? You know, how is the tower getting to the, the, the building? Uh, with respect to a ground, is it a, a satisfactory ground? You know, I've seen a lot of guys just run over to, you know, the local Home Depot and buy a roll of 14 gauge THHN and say, good enough. And uh, that's called fuse line in this world. Yeah. Uh, you know, so you know, make sure that there's strap there. If there's not strap, make sure it's ample enough cable. Uh, I believe, uh, what is it? Uh, if you do a two watt run, that is equivalent to a two inch strap, I want to say. So a two inch strap has the same nominal surface area as a yeah. four watt cable. Yeah. For what it's so, worth. Now, and yeah. two things to keep in mind here too, is that Lightning's got a lot of high frequency components. I've seen a, a few presentations recently about folks that'll design a ground system around the concept of grounding all the 300 megahertz energy and while that doesn't hurt anything because it does require a lot of good bounding at ground or bonding and short straight runs, you're mm -hmm. not, I, I question the value of it for the right. cost because the, the bulk of the energy is going to be in the lower frequency range. Uh, right. When, one of our engineers has done a lot of study on that. And Mike says typically around 10 mega or 10 kilohertz uh, is where the bulk of the energy is. Now, granted, uh, there is a fairly linear component uh, decaying uh, of energy all the way up to a megahertz or so, and then after that, it's an exponential decay. So right, yeah. do do there... focus on the, the one megahertz and less. Skin effect comes into a play, but uh, you need to be able to handle a lot of current. So if you're using yep. four inch strap that's aluminum foil thick, you're gonna have problems. Right, right, yeah, so, and, and... Having you know ordered those spools of uh, four inch strap and, and you know the 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 management looks at it and says why was that three thousand yeah. dollars? Well, I call it your insurance policy. You yeah. know, yeah. does it work? I've never had a problem, so yeah, I guess it does. You yeah. know, yeah. so well, those are the things the... that you start looking at first and foremost yeah. is how is the system when you walk into it, is the rack grounded? Because I've walked into sites where their idea of grounding the transmitter was setting the transmitter on top of the strap. Yep. Keep in mind uh, the chassis are powder coated. <laughs> some of them, yep. And yeah. even if they're not, like uh, with ours, if they're not powder coated in some cases, most they are, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, high temp paint for us. But anyway, the uh, we use an insulated, isolated ground to maintain single point throughout the, the transmitter. Mm -hmm. And if you sit it on a ground strap, even if you scrape the paint away, then you've just defeated that entire single point ground system. Correct. Um, Fernando makes one good uh, a good question, uh, whether or not RF and uh, Site Earth should be joined. And so the short answer is, especially in the US, uh, depending what state you're in, because different states follow different volumes of NEC or don't follow NEC at all. Um, so Mississippi, for example, the state electrical code is the only one that applies. They don't follow NEC, the national electrical code in any way. Uh, Minnesota, where Alex is, they follow the 2014 edition of the NEC. So it varies state to state. You need well, to be aware of that. And we have here in Minnesota um, county-based guidelines that go above and beyond the NEC in certain instances, uh, yep, specifically and, for and, industrial and retail. And above uh, state code as well. Mm -hmm. So there's multiple layers here. As a rule, NEC is, is sort of the baseline, and they have specified that your electrical and your facility grounds do need to be bonded together and they've said that since about 2010. It's Article 250, if you're interested. Um, I don't know if anybody's got a copy of the several odd thousand pages of the NEC kicking around, but uh, there you go. Uh, so yeah, absolutely, your electrical and your uh, 
and your site, uh, your facility ground should be bonded together. Um, right. And again, you should have ideally a single reference point where they tie together and that is the point for the facility. Um, a couple of shout outs while I'm thinking of it. Uh, Mr. Disembodied Voice, Ed Sylvester is back with us after a little bit of a hiatus. So Ed, thanks, uh, glad to have you back. Uh, if uh, anybody's been missing them, we uh, did a little contest last year where we buried uh, pictures of not Ed throughout the, the presentation. Uh, I don't remember if there's one hidden in this one, but uh, <laughs> if there isn't, we'll start it we'll next week. We'll find out. Yeah, well, it'll I'm, be a surprise. I'm, I'm very pleased to be back. Thanks, uh, thanks, Jeff. And uh, another shout out, our owner and CEO, Kevin Rogers, has signed on and in the audience. So I don't know whether the real boss is uh, bored and just uh, wanted to see if I was talking nice about him, but uh, shout out to him for joining in. So it's always good when you uh, had the management paying attention. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's that. First thing I look for is is what am I doing there? What what is the grounding situation? What's my AC situation? Things like that, because they all tie together. Obviously, uh, you know, you could have wild leg uh, power coming in. You could have single phase. The power company can screw up just as badly as the guy who built the building. So sure. you yeah you have to pay attention to a lot of things all at once before you even take a screwdriver out of the box and start racking up your new gear. So, so a little side note there, I walked into a site outside of, uh, actually down, I don't know if he's in the audience, but uh, Kirk Harnack uh, will, uh, will know this site uh, because it's uh, outside of Memphis, down near his uh, neck of the woods. Mm. And uh, we had an issue with one of our boxes losing uh, power supplies, not, not power supplies, power amplifiers, modulators in this case. And typically modulator failures come back to power supply related type stuff. Mm -hmm. So we looked and we looked and we looked. I went down a couple of times. Uh, the guy above me in the food chain for support at the time went down once or twice. Uh, finally, we had one of the design guys down there and he's walking around scratching his head, can't see anything we haven't already found. Looked at the two gauge aluminum down lead coming down the primary power pole, gave it a tug and it came out. It ended about two inches below grade. It would just uh, totally disintegrate it. So yeah, mm -hmm. power companies uh, quite frequently mm -hmm. will have uh, less than ideal uh, grounds to work with. Right. So so verify all of that before you start sticking things in. I, I know one of the the older tricks in the book is, uh, you know, take the strap and bond it to the rack so everything going into the rack is bonded. Not always true. So. Um, and then it creates, you know, everybody says you each individual device should have a ground to it. That is the proper method. But as long as it goes back to one point, that's what matters. Right. Well, and what I tell folks is that, especially like if you're in a facility and somebody, uh, forget where it was. Um, just let me bear with me while I flip through this big long list. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one that I've got to hit later too, uh, the testing grounding. There's a couple of questions on that. Mm -hmm. uh, here it is. Any tips on what you do when you don't or don't own the site or you do, but uh, delicate dollars are an issue and grounding is almost non-existent. That, Curtis, is a challenge. Um, That's more of a political problem than a technical one. Right. Now, within your facility, assuming, again, that you've got your own transmitter room or transmitter area, you can single point ground everything, but you need to have a point where it goes to the outside world and goes to Earth. And unfortunately, as we've already discussed, you can't rely on the electrical ground for a couple of reasons. One, because electrical grounds in AC wiring are for safety. So their purpose is primarily to keep, you know, to give you a ground reference there for 60 Hertz. They don't care about the higher frequency components. So you're usually dealing with six gauge or smaller safety grounds. And, and if it's those, an older installation, they're using the EMT pipe as that ground sometimes. Sometimes. So again, that that is a challenge. Uh, sometimes if you're leasing, you can work with the uh, site caretaker. If you do own it and ca dollars are an issue, then the one thing I recommend is uh, put at least one ground rod so you've got something into the earth. Now, somebody, a couple other folks mentioned, what do you do when uh, ground conductivity is uh, less than ideal? Like uh, I've got a reference to uh, Micah Peak, which glitters in the sunlight. I think there's one of those in Utah too. Uh, 
So uh, this call, this one's uh, Jerry from uh, from uh, Spokane. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, in a case like that, I've got one site on a mountain in Arkansas where they had a lot of problems like that, and they ended up drilling a well and using the well casing as their ground. Mm -hmm. You know, so or chemical grounds I've seen a lot in the Southwest Arizona yeah. and stuff like that, where you actually have to create your own. Right uh, up uh -huh. here, a lot of the AMs when we had AMs, uh, because Nova Scotia is pretty much where where the glaciers ended up. Um, and they pushed a lot of rock in front of them, so we're all granite, uh, you know, and when they uh, drilled the well from my house recently, they hit uh, bedrock at about 12 and a half, 13 feet down. Mm. And uh, then they drilled 287 feet further through granite all the way. Um, yeah, which, and in my neck of the woods, I can get a sand point in 10 feet. So, yeah. so uh, it uh, very much, you may need to use a chemically augmented, but you need to establish a ground at some point. Um, if you own the building, a ground rod at Home Depot and a uh, hammer drill attachment to drive it between the two of them are about $200. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you know, it, it all comes back to, and I've said this over and over and over, the amount you spend on grounding is determined by two things, and neither one of them is your budget. Um, it's determined by the value of the stuff you're protecting, and it's determined by where you live and what your chance is of getting hit by lightning. If I'm in the, well, in my neck of the woods where we see a lightning strike every couple of years as a rule per square kilometer or so, I'm not going to typically invest as much as if I was in Florida where I see a lightning strike every hour or so per square kilometer. And I mean, I'm exaggerating, but. A you know, bad storm in Minnesota. I've watched towers get struck dozens of times in a 20 minute storm. So. Right. And if you're the tower owner, it behooves you to know what your tower is sitting on. So a soil sample and report of conduct, ground conductivity from a local surveyor, so on and so forth, all of that is worth worth its weight in gold to know what you're working with. Yep. It'll tell you how your tower is doing from a, 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 just a, a foundation perspective. You know, was it yep. done right? You know, because what if it's starting to lean because it's sinking? Well, because you got water underneath it. Exactly. So Ray Lewis has asked about um, braided strap versus solid strap. And this comes back to the, for me, I like two things. I like lots of surface area, which of course the braid would give you more of than the, sol than the solid. But I also like lots of current carrying capability, which I'm going to get from a solid conductor more. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kirk Harnack had asked something similar in the advanced questions, uh, thin copper strap versus large round copper wire and stranded versus solid ground wire. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, it, it is a judgment call, but uh, Alex, I mean, and some it's of convenience too. Getting through the concrete block of a building, you may not be able to get, you know, a slit for a four-inch strap to go through. You know, maybe all you do have is a hammer drill. So, well, then two two aughts, you know, in parallel to each other, is going mm -hmm. to get you through that wall, right? A lot I'm easier. John Van Milligan asked that that was a liquid ground in my picture, and no, that that's just the concrete uh, floor on the tray. Um, so the what's wrong with this picture is that you'll see that a lot of those ground wires are not run as short and straight as they could be. There's quite a bit of looping, and, mm -hmm. uh, and we try to minim we try to minimize the length exactly. Yeah. Uh, so we'll skip forward for another one, and and you can see a theme because looping is one of those things that I look at, and I almost I told somebody somebody goes you never put a picture up where you don't say there's something wrong with it, and it's like well I don't think I've ever seen a perfect ground system just yet. But uh, I don't think they I, honestly I've been to many of them, including the R56 done by AT and T back in the day, and mm -hmm. even there you can look around and go, but that one doesn't make you created a loop right here. You yeah. know, and they probably didn't even realize that they're just following the book and, you know, got cross-eyed because there's a lot to follow in that book. Right. You now, know, so I, I've seen even the ones that are done by the book done wrong. Right. Uh, Patrick mentions, he asks if uh, running a ground strap from a tower into a saltwater ocean bore is any benefit. And I, right off the bat, I got to say, if you've got the ability to do that, then yeah, it is. Um, downside, the challenge to it is, of course, salt water will tend to um, oxidize materials pretty quickly. So uh, you do need to, uh, you know, put it on the maintenance schedule to inspect that. 
But uh, by all means, if you can get into the ocean, you are dealing with the lowest impedance that you can possibly get as far as an Earth connection goes, and the biggest surface area, literally on the world in the on the planet. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so yeah, if it's an option, by all means, I would certainly do that. Um, you know, and I've seen a lot of uh, coastal navigation sites where that's what they've done. I've seen one or two AM sites that were fairly coastal like that too. Ham radio guys like to go to the, on the ocean and throw their counterpoise right into the salt water and see it go. It's 20 watts and they're acting like they're 1,000 watts. So yeah, yeah so there's a Bill, reason for that. Bill made a comment here and uh, anybody who's seen my grounding presentations before, and I'm not sure if I've got that picture in here, but uh, the uh, I, I'm gonna actually, Bill, uh, I think Bill's still here. I'm going to unmute you again, unless you're still unmuted. I've got to wait for the, uh, there we go. You're still unmuted. So tell me the story about the uh, sixth floor equipment room. Ah, well, back in the bad old days, I worked for Southern Pacific, Pacific Communication, which is a company that later became Sprint. And uh, we had a telephone switch uh, in the, like the sixth floor of the, of the building in Los Angeles and this beautiful copper uh, pipe came out the wall to a to a fixture so everybody thought well there's there you go there's your single point ground source uh, you know we're six floors up there's probably like copper all the way down to the down to the ground and and you know into the Los Angeles uh, water supply what a ground Except that sometime in the you know dim past, there had been a repair done, and uh, the people who did the repair spliced a piece of PVC pipe into that into that beautiful ground. Uh, we ran around in circles for months trying to find all the problems that caused uh, until we figured out what what the issue was. Then we bridged it with a with a piece of strap and and. Uh, you know, bridge the PVC with a piece of strap and went on. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and I ran into one, a little one kilowatt AM. Oh, it must have been a quarter of a century ago. I can't believe I've been doing this that long and then some. But uh, it was uh, the owner had done the install in one of these, you know, very small sites where the owner, chief cook, water washer, sales guy, engineer, you do everything you need to do to get the job done. And a friend of his who was electrically oriented had told him that a cold water pipe made a good ground, but the friend didn't tell him that it did have to be some sort of metallic cold water pipe. So absolutely, that's uh, that's not the only time I've heard about that. Um, now, we've got a good comment here from uh, Jack Rowland, and he makes a really good point. And I have beaten this drum over and over and over. Uh, we talk about bonding and we talk about uh, connecting. We, like, so grounding and bonding from an NEC perspective are two totally separate things. Um, They're different bonding, words for a reason. <laughs> right. Bonding is the act of exothermically connecting two conductors, whether it's CAD welded, uh, whether it's brazed, whether it's uh, solder, I guess, qualifies. Uh, whereas grounding, of course, is the act of connecting something to common point or to earth, depending. And if you take it a step further in the UK, earthing is actually a thing relative to that. Mm -hmm. So uh, absolutely, when we're talking about uh, connecting grounds, when at all possible, I prefer an exothermic connection. I like to see things bonded, whether they're uh, silfost, whether they're CAD welded, which is, of course, as I've said, my favorite. If you do have to crimp a lug onto something, you need to have the right crimper and die for both the lug and the material being crimped. And that can get spendy really, really fast. Oh yeah, I have one of the nice um, uh, Milwaukee crimp tools for big lugs, you know, it'll do four out wire for electrical. Yeah, that thing was not a cheap purchase whatsoever, but you know what? It, the peace of mind when you see that come out when you're at a customer site and they're like, what the heck are you doing with that? Grounding. And they're like, what? <laughs> you know, uh, in, in a lot of places I can't use the exothermic because it, whether it's in a, you know, 51st floor of a high rise building in downtown Minneapolis, they don't like flames that high for some reason. Right. Uh, you know, so you, you have to resort to, you know, mechanical connection and mechanical connections. Remember, a lot of this stuff is copper. 
as Jeff is so famously for saying, <laughs> it's malleable, it moves, it gets hot, it gets cold. So make sure you double, triple, quadruple check, put it on your maintenance PM list. Make sure your grounds are actually tight because uh, was it your house there, your, your, your ground rod that was a little bit uh, on the loose side there once, once upon a time? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it was. It uh, actually features in some of my presentations still. Mm -hmm. um, Another little shout out, uh, when we get all these uh, advanced questions, uh, Chris Evans with uh, Odyssey down in uh, South Carolina, I see him in the audience, birthday shout out to Chris, he didn't say how old he happy is, birthday. but and I'm not going to sing the song, nope. but, uh, but happy birthday, Chris, here's to many more. Um, right. Al, uh, <laughs> yeah, th there you go, uh, Jack mentioned soldering won't melt and should not be used, uh, and again, I don't disagree, but if you've got a torch and high temp solder or Silphos yeah. is my preference, sometimes you have to compromise. Plumbing solder and a map gas is better than nothing. And again, it depends. If you're trying to connect to a ground rod, that just ain't going to happen. That ain't going to get you there either, yeah. yeah but I mean, I, if you're trying to get, you know, sticking it under a screw or whatever, just something, you know, to get mm -hmm. you by until you get the proper connection. Um, you know, another thing to ca keep in mind too, I kind of switching gears is that you see these, you know, bus bars here and all these ground lines there and the bulkheads and such. And when you start looking at these, a lot of guys will run, oh, I got my nice big fat strap here that I'm going to run over to my bus bar and then under on the floor and up and into the transmitter, right? They didn't pay attention to the fact that it touched the conduit holding the light switch up right next to it either. That so you seems gotta, to me, watch out for things. I made it a point not to embarrass you publicly in any of these presentations, but I've got I'm used to it. Uh, that 10 kilowatt install with that uh, custom ground strap run. So uh, yeah. Yeah. Now, yep. this is uh, something else that let's see, just came in. You get a lot of stuff coming by me here. This is uh, really kind of cool. Mm. Um, so folks, I want to thank you very much for, for the participation. Um, Definitely, uh, okay, if you've got to crimp lugs, then uh, crimp the lugs and then fill them with solder using a propane torch. And uh, yeah, again, like I say, it uh, belt and braces. If you've got the mm. proper crimp tool, it's not bad, but uh, it's not my preference. Um, yeah, I've seen guys sit there with, uh, you know, the, the, the hammer shot one, like the battery store puts on terminals for your car and stuff like that. It, they work, they're not the greatest. You know, I've I've seen right. guys sit there and try and pinch them with vice grips and stuff like that. Uh, I'd rather have no lug if you're going to do that. Well, and that's like I said, sometimes you got to make a judgment call. But if you do that, you better have some kind of exothermic connection. Um, David Creel mentions talking a bit about how to properly ground equipment in a least high rise, and that's a good one for this particular picture because the photo to the left is the uh, is the um, surge protector connection at a site, and I want to say that was in uh, Willis Tower, might have been Hancock, Chicago somewhere. Chicago, yeah. Uh, so definitely a high rise, you know, 80 plus floors up, and the the black wire you see to the right of the bus bar looping up into the conduit, we'll talk about that in a second too, is the connection to their surge protector not the ideal solution uh, number one and we'll talk about ferrites in a bit but if you run a single conductor through a conduit you've effectively created or a single yeah single conductor through a conduit you've effectively created an inductor so you've added a lot of impedance to uh, a circuit that you need the lowest impedance possible on the ground connection so if you are in a high rise and you have to run all exposed cables through conduit, which does happen, but in that situation, you're by all means, wherever possible, use uh, PVC or uh, non-conductive conduit. Or the other option is to, if they'll let you uh, connect the cable to the conduit, uh, like if you've got to run a ground wire and make the conduit part of the ground. Yep. Or, you know, in this case too, the, 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 the two for there is you're making the cable do a 180 just the same. You want to try and keep that as straight as possible. So it should come mm -hmm. down and straight down onto the top instead of looping back around. It looks pretty in the one it looks like that, but lightning doesn't like to go around corners. Right. 
Uh, oh, another birthday shout out to John Van Milligan, who's uh, also a little older today. And John also didn't specify how much older. <laughs> well, obviously a day older than yesterday. Right. Um, <laughs> Aren't we I'm all about to, Yeah, I'm about to install a J1000 to replace an ND1. The ND1 was very happy with all the bonding and grounding done in 2001. What sh more should I do to make the J1000 happy? I've heard they're a little touchy with summer weather. Not incorrect, Dave. Um, two things uh number one especially with the j1000 if you didn't get it with the nd1 the surge protector that we provide uh with the one kilowatts has a one-to-one -one isolation transformer that protects somewhat against stuff coming back from the antenna again nothing's a hundred percent but it will help um if the grounding you did before worked well then you should be i, I don't know if i'd mess with that i mean yeah just leave it be right if but, you yep. didn't give you any problems you weren't losing pas or, or you know constantly having little fault lights turned on on that pa on the nd1 you did it right well, and on the nd1 the big thing you would have had the issue with was the power probe the uh little mm -hmm. transformer in the nafp39 especially the early editions like to arc on occasion so uh yeah, it, I wouldn't worry about that too much, but definitely if you don't have that, uh, our surge protector, then uh, reach out to your sales guy and get a quote on that. Um, question, and there's a good one. That's uh, Leon asked, uh, what's the opinion on using antiox on ground bus connections? And I love it. Um, no locks for me, but uh, whatever. Yeah. Um, anywhere where you have to use a compression connection whether it's a piece of strap bolted to a ground bus like we show here a lug bolted to a ground bus two things crimped together use an antioxidant of some sort especially those screw on terminals um because they'll gall themselves and they, you'll you'll have nothing but problems afterwards uh right. yeah so use not sparingly but not liberally right and Mark Voris mentions, and I think Jack mentioned it earlier, uh, avoiding sharp bends or turns. And I, I had to scroll up a long way, but I think Jack, had, it was Jack. And if I got the wrong person, then I, I'm apologizing right now. Ideally, try to keep your ground flowing in a constant direction. Like if you look at this right hand picture, your ground strap comes up from the bottom and right beside it, there's a wire going down and looping around. So any energy has got to come down and almost make a U-turn to get uh, mm -hmm. to get to ground. And uh, that's what we try to avoid. Try to keep a, a constant flow so there's not a lot of U-turns or sharp bends. Um, so thanks very much for the folks that uh, brought that up. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, Dave has mentioned, got the surge suppression that's uh, mentioned or for the uh, J-1000. So yeah, that's... Uh, that's a good thing. Uh, yeah, that, that, that was a thing I was talking about before uh, the program here was, you know, when I, Jeff being the sales guy is, you know, I've, I've seen many of his quotes over the years and, and it's always the surge suppressor is the optional item and it's never listed. I, I, I'm the advocate that says it's the question of, do you have one already and do, or do you need a new one? Yeah. Or do you need one period? There is, you should not, that should not be an option when you buy a new transmitter, realistically. Right. You know, well, this, is, again, this is a small insurance policy to help deal with what mother nature does best. <laughs> yeah. uh, Patrick's got a good one here. Uh, it's a little lengthy. So Patrick, uh, I don't know if you've got a microphone, but I am going to scroll down here. I probably should have Ed doing this because Ed's a lot more uh, talented when it comes to finding people in the list, especially when we get over a hundred of you. Uh, but uh there a good comment about a site in bermuda with a whole bunch of uh gear that needs to be uh there we go all right so patrick i have unmuted you if you've uh, got a microphone and unmute yourself i see your green uh tell me a little bit about this uh and this is the bermuda site hi jeff thank you so much uh always enjoy your talks wish i could uh wish we could have been at uh, nab so i could come and listen to your 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 great talk again um but but thank you for the opportunity yes we have uh, we actually have three nautel fm transmitters that we put in uh four years ago they're running fantastically well we've also got a couple of uh rotor ro rotary schwartz uh tv transmitters we've got an old legacy building with i think it's about four inch strap that runs from our tower through through the transmitter holes into the buildings 
and uh, it's kind of embedded in the concrete almost. The problem that we uh, uh, experience is that sometimes the lightning strikes the the utility lines, the the electricity lines, or the or the telephone lines, or the or the cable TV system, and it it makes its way into our building. I guess because the grounding is quite good on the tower. How do we how do we filter that out? Um, I know you you talk a lot about um, I forget the, the the term, but it's those little rings that go around uh, the electrical totally strap. Yes. All right, so we we put them on our on our transmitters after we spoke to you. But how do we filter out all of this bad uh, you know bad work from the from the utility companies that bring so, it into our buildings? First question, and I don't see it addressed here. Do you have a shunt type surge protector on the AC mains? Yeah, I don't know. I, I, our chief engineer may be on this call because I asked him to be on, uh, Errolston, if he's there. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll have to so, find out. I don't know. So that's that. That would be note number one, and and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But the uh, ideally, what we're trying to do is establish a path between the power lines and the ground at the, the the reference ground for the facility, which is where the towers should be bonded as well. And uh, that will help a lot from anything coming in on the AC lines. Um, and it's a bi-directional path because if you get a tower spike and ground potential spikes high at the uh, base of the tower, then it can go out through the AC lines, is through the surge protector to the AC lines, as opposed to through all the switching supplies in the, in the facility as well. So that would be the first thing. Um, things like uh, phone lines, uh, any uh, smaller smaller coaxes, you can uh, put ferrites over them. Make sure that they are grounded. The shield of the coax is grounded to your reference ground as well. And uh, phone lines, you can get things like uh, optical isolators. Uh, what's uh, Storm and Protection? Is that the one that uh, makes the little phone line ones, Alex? Yeah. Uh, so what I've been doing for like the uh, you know, uh, ISP stuff, if you got a DSL line or a cable modem or something like that. Uh, I usually, I've gone to the uh, Dave Anderson method there, uh, who used to be with uh, Joy FM down in uh, Southern Florida there. And I prefer to use fiber optic to link because I found that now with like DOCSIS 3.0 and 3.1 coming about, putting this ferrite, so it's actually ringing off the high frequency that's actually limiting the speed in the modem. So you can't really do that trick anymore, just like the old DSL things. It's, get, it's getting on that hairy edge. Mm -hmm. So what I've gone to is, you know what? Those modems are rented from the cable company. They get struck. It's the cable company's problem, not mine. Uh, but you're still down. <laughs> I'm still down, but that's why you have one on the shelf, because now in the U.S. here specifically, I can go to Best Buy and pick one up and just throw it on the shelf. Right. Uh, I can buy them. So, but using um, an Ethernet to a fiber optic back to Ethernet, if you need to cross, basically creating my own isocoupler, uh, mm -hmm. optic, uh, optical isolator uh, to isolate those types of lines coming in from the outside world. Anything overhead is fair game. And you know, at some point, all your wiring at some point does go overhead. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, cable, phone, um, satellite lines, even if you got a dish outside, just the same. Um, all of that, so, figure out a way of uh, protecting those just the same. Things that a lot of guys don't think about. They're like, oh, how did the lightning get in? I've done all this stuff. And I'm like, well, what about your satellite dish? Oh. <laughs> yeah, so, sure, sure. We, we've, we've, we've put, we have a big satellite farm for all our downlinks and we've actually put them all on fiber optic coming back into our building. But but it, it's such an old building that, you know, you, you I keep finding, you know, what what is this? This is probably from 50, 60 years ago. That's uh, oh, yeah. so, yeah, it's uh, it's tricky. Yeah, yeah. you find that old RG11 and it's like, wait, when we use this? Well, and that's right. one of the things with grounds, too, because as things get added, grounds get added. And the next thing you know, you've got four layers of ground going and you know, have no idea what's connected to where. Or if you so, have an AM site, you don't know the state of your ground, most likely. Right, so it does make some challenges. Um, right. So Alex, here's a question for you. Jerry Olson asked if you have a, uh, well, so two, uh, Laverne asked if there's a recommended antioxidant and uh, Jerry Olson asks if uh, all antioxidants are created equal. Ooh, um, no and no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, like you said, the no-lock stuff or anything like that works just, just great. Um, you know, I, I like that just the same. Uh, but are they all created equal? Not always. Uh, you know, there are 
um, different chemicals designed for different areas. Yeah. Uh, you know, there there are ones that are more um, anti-corrosive for like saltwater areas down along the Gulf Coast or on the West Coast. There's mm-hmm. a lot of them made for the desert and high plains stuff. Um, they are formulated two different types, so be aware. Uh, that's why if you go look at Dolox, they make like four different bottles, I think it is, and they're all color coded. Yeah. Pay attention to the ingredients there because the, they actually tell you made for high corrosive air, made for salt water, made for, you know, uh, uh, alkaline uh, stuff, you know, uh, right. like I did a tower in South Dakota where it's all rock. Well, mm-hmm. you know, dealing with that is a, is a, is a challenge in its own right. So, yeah, yeah, pay attention to what you're putting on there. Very much and, so. Uh, so tied into the picture on the screen, uh, this is a uh, site I walked into. That's the primary ground from their uh, search protector. And again, you'll notice it going through the conduit, uh, which we've already discussed. Uh, and you can see it's uh, connected to a ground rod, a ground rod, um, because that's not a ground rod. It's the J-bolt that holds the building onto the concrete pad. Doesn't go below um, the concrete. Right. And so make sure your ground is really ground. And this comes back along the lines with the uh, with the discussion of the PVC being inserted into the water pipe that uh, Bill was talking about. Mm-hmm. And it leads into, um, and we, we touched on it earlier, but uh, Stan Carter asked about uh, what, what do I think about halo grounds that they're already installed in a prefab shelter. And So the short answer is, for me, I like them because they are almost always crimped with the proper tools. You've got really good ground points. You have a nice perimeter ring around the roof of the building. Um, The downside is it's very easy to create a ground loop. So my preference, if I've got a hello ground, and, and I've seen a lot of them installed where there would be a a, an out lead, if you will, leaving going outside at the corner of each building and going down to a ground rod. So now I've got four separate ground points. And of course, earth has a potential, sometimes a pretty high, or sorry, resistance. So mm-hmm. all four of those on lightning strike as current flows through earth are going to be at a different potential. Um, depending on where they go inside the building, that can be a huge problem. So. I don't mind halo ground inside the building, but I still only want to see one ground point leaving the building. Is is, I guess my key. The big popular thing now is that a lot of those cell sites, those shelters are coming up on the used market that broadcasters are absolutely in love with because that stuff is already in there. Mm -hmm. Make sure you pay attention to that when you move the building. You know, I've seen that happen where a guy bought a building, dropped it onto his leased uh, SBA site, and you know same thing you know he oh well, i put in four rods aren't you aren't you proud of me no I screwed it up <laughs> yeah. you know and then it now, wasn't even bonded to the tower the rest of the way he was using the yeah. coax bond i'll quantify that you can put and i do like a perimeter ground around the building but if you right. put the four rods outside the building join them together with strap or yep. some yep. very high or high gauge low induct or low resistance uh, conductor mm-hmm. And again, uh, because if you put it below grade, it's hard to look at. Yeah. So, you know, if you can try and get it right along the surface so you can keep inspecting it, yeah, paint it, put tar pit, tar over it, whatever, to, to make it not look shiny, whatever right. you got to do uh, for your local area and how bad copper and pr- metal prices are these days again. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you need to be able to see that. Otherwise, you don't know. Right. Now, Rajesh has asked uh, how the uh, 110, 230 volt AC power supply ground, uh, earth wire and lightning ground are connected. And so the short answer is, is at your electrical entrance, the power company should have a ground drop and to a ground rod if you're on a, a building at ground level and not in a high rise. Mm-hmm. Um, that should, in that mythical perfect world, be bonded. There's the no difference between bonding and uh, grounding. Bonded to your reference ground point. And, and the challenge is that they're usually at opposite ends of the building because most people put the reference ground where the coax comes in at the back of the building and the AC comes in from the street at the front of the building. So it can require a little bit of uh, creative wire routing, if we will. Right, but, uh, and, definitely and, uh, having them together. 
And usually the power company is told when the guy shows up on site, like a lot of my sites have, um, you know, a, a transformer vault. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where the ground is dragged in from the power company. And right. sometimes it's not the greatest ground, but sometimes yeah. you get lucky and the power company will say, use the thinnest wire that's required by law. Uh, but if the electrician is hooking it up for you, you just look at him and say, I'll, I'll buy you an extra beer after work if you can make that bigger. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And, and uh, they usually and will. Rajesh makes a good point that uh, before joining them, you can have a difference voltage, a, a potential difference between the two. And uh, that can create noise and ground loops, uh, especially yes. if you're running an analog facility with uh, low levels of audio. Right. So. Uh, that is, yeah, a very another really good argument for tying together, less from a lightning protection perspective and more from just having a clean signal. I mean, so, look, uh, if Thor wants in, Thor's getting in. Uh, what yeah. we're trying to do here is make sure it doesn't go through the transmitter to get there. Right. <laughs> and give it better options, even if it is, it, lightning's going to do what lightning's going to do. Uh, yeah. But w if we can give, a, as human beings, give it a better way to ground, give it a better way to ground. Exactly. Uh, one of the other things is make sure that you can do the best grounding in the building at all, but when that strap leaves to go to the ground rod, if it ends three feet from the, or three inches from the sidewall and is uh, buried under, uh, in this case, uh, vines full of chiggers, mm -hmm. then uh, it's uh, a best ground in the building, doesn't matter at all if it's not connected outside. Right. Um, by the same token, if you're gonna drive a two foot ground rod into gravel, make sure you drive it straight down so it actually makes it into earth. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is uh, a, another situation. I bent down to check the integrity of the ground rod and pulled it out of the ground. Um, now, one little side note here, and I am going to throw this out. We have at the moment 137 people listening in, so thank you all for joining us. Uh, uh, one, I got a request from Sean Mattingly about uh, anybody with a Mager who uh, wouldn't mind traveling to test his grounding effectiveness, and he, he emphasizes he will pay. Uh, Sean is in Muncie, Indiana, so anybody in the central U.S. that wants to do a little bit of uh, contract work and happens to have a Mager, drop me a line and I'll hook you up with Sean. Um, by that note, and this is one for you, Alex, uh, Andy Lowe and Eric uh, Fredericy have both asked about uh, testing ground systems. Testing ground systems. Well, uh, nothing uh, nothing helps more than a good old multimeter. Um, yep. Yeah, and, and a, a little bit of a a little bit of clip lead uh, <laughs> because you're going to have to go crisscrossing across the building every once in a while. Um, you know, so a nice heavy cable, not necessarily a clip lead, but. You know, you, you, you want to make sure that where you think your one point is, is one side, and then you take your lead, go the around, and if you hear a beep, okay, good. And then when you hit that one thing that doesn't, you're like, wait, what? <laughs> now, you know. for what it's worth, and I think they, I'm pretty sure it was Kintronic's website that I saw it on, they had a uh, ground system tester, which is just basically a, a mega with a nine foot cable and two short ground rods. And you just drive right. them into the ground and then hit it with the mega to uh, measure your ground resistance. Because right. that, that's a really good point that uh, the folks that have brought this up is uh, very useful. Um, knowing the earth conductivity for the area you're in, especially if you're an AM, not just for the grounding perspective, because to be brutal, any earth is not going to, unless you're in salt water, you're not going to have as good a ground as I can do with copper strap and a couple of rods. Right. But, uh, but if I'm someplace where it's pure sand for 20 feet down, then that tells me that I probably, you know, a couple of eight foot rods aren't going to do me a lot of good. Right. At that point, I'm looking at chem rod or drilling a well to get an earth connection. Right. Um, you get a little further down sometimes. Right. Or by the same token that uh, the bread and some of the others mentioned when you're in the mountains and up on the rock. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that case, sometimes I've got sites, uh, Lookout Mountain, they've got a, pretty much a chemically augmented ground system. It's it's not an actual ground. It's a big pit full of backfill. Yep. I've got so, a guy uh, in the mountains there, too, who basically bought a pile of slit screen from the, the copper mill and made his own ground screen under his towers because that's all they had. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it wasn't easy to do chemical at that elevation. It wasn't easy to do anything. And getting a well driller up 10,000 feet wasn't happening. Right. So, you know, sometimes you just got to make your own. So one other thing that I like to talk about 
is ferrites. I know nobody's ever heard me talk about ferrites before, ever. Um, and ferrite is basically a ring of uh, carbon and iron, and it'll vary depending, but uh, some ferrous material and some bonding agent and an epoxy to hold it all together so you don't end up with a pile of dust. And uh, they come in different uh, compositions, as I said, with more iron or less iron uh, based on the permeability. I've got a bunch of links coming up at the end that uh, will, uh, if you want to grab a screenshot of them that, and you want to learn a lot more about permeability and how ferrites work. Uh, remember again that we're dealing with fairly low frequency signals for this, but we are dealing with fast rise times and we are dealing with components at and above a megahertz. So uh, the ferrites come really helpful for decoupling common mode surges because, and this is the part where if you're watching my camera, I try to do it by hand. But uh, if you've got a ground and a uh, center conductor and uh, you have a surge on one and the ferrite uh, comes towards saturation and induces a, a current into the other, when they both go up the same amount, the potential difference stays the same then uh, you've got less chance of damage than if you have one conductor or the other spiking high with the potential difference to the other one being the same. So uh, so that's the very brief in a nutshell of how ferrites work. And I'm kind of high speeding because we're already hitting the top of the hour and I'm just getting wound up. Uh, right. There's plenty should've... of YouTube videos out there too that you can, uh, uh, the, you know, the self-education factor. There's the 10-minute YouTube yeah. video that tells you exactly with the cute little animations on how ferrites actually do work and what the chemical right. mixes and, and stuff mean. So uh, one of the questions that uh, that Don had asked was, I mentioned ferrites often, we know, and mm -hmm. that I had talked about 43 material and uh, years ago mentioned we use J material. And uh, actually the two that I looked up yesterday for a customer are both J material, the little three quarter inch one and the uh, two and a quarter inch inside diameter that we provide for the smaller transmitters. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the material, again, the material types are based on uh, iron composition, and uh, permeability. If you go to the Amadon website, Amadon Corporation Ferrites, if you Google that much, you will find that uh, they've got some really good charts on the different materials, uh, cutoff frequencies, saturation frequencies, permeability, all that great stuff. So uh, the, for what we use, J material or 43, or what we've used over the years, but uh, you know, you, again, for common mode protection, uh, I had this discussion recently. I always said that the lowest saturation frequency you could get was the best, but when you think about it, and, and somebody brought this up and called me on it in an SBE meeting, um, picking a slightly higher saturation frequency isn't necessarily bad, because once you hit saturation, the effectiveness, the ability of the ferrite to, uh, to transfer charge is uh, reduced. So that's, uh, that's a good point. They're also a really good key indicator of what's going on in your facility because they they, they do one thing really, really well. Either I've, I've walked into sites going, where are your ferrites? Oh, there's the dust pile on the floor. They've shattered. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, when you go grab them, you know, and, and feel them, they should be cold. If right. you feel well, any ambient. heat at all, you have an imbalance. And that uh, kind of works well into this slide so that it's almost like you've seen this before. Almost. Um, but uh, exactly, especially on an AM, uh, if your feed and your return currents are not equal, then the ferrite will be warm uh, as it's saturating and uh, transforming current. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is very, very much what uh, is something that uh, that you should pay attention to. It's first thing um, I walk into after someone calls me and says I had a lightning strike, something's wrong, you know, but the transmitter's on. I'll walk right over to the ferrites first and grab them. It's like okay. Are we okay here? Yep, yep, yep exactly. So uh, they're they're an excellent troubleshooting tool in that regard. Now, where do you put ferrites? I put them everywhere. Um, anywhere where I have a feed and a return, and it could be multiple feeds, like an AC cable where I've got two phases or three phases and a, and a ground return. Um, it could be the coax, of course, where I've got a single feed and a return. Uh, Cat5 cable works well cat six whatever i'm dating myself at least i didn't say cat three um right <laughs> anyway uh 
you know, so uh, audio cables, remote cables, again, anywhere where you have a feed and a return, you should have a ferrite. If you've got enough room, then th like in this picture where we've got the two on the AC, that's nice, but uh, you could, or the uh, coax, it would have been nice to use one of them on the AC and loop the AC through it a few times. Mm -hmm. uh, because basically a ferrite with a cable through it creates an inductor. If you loop it, you create an inductor with twice as much inductance. Right. Um, any ham operator, and I know Alex, you've got a ham license who's ever wound a choke, more turns, more inductance. Right. Now here, let me throw this back at you because I know the answer, but the rest of the, the audience here may not. Where's the point of diminishing returns? Why do we only ship two of that size? Cost. I mean, besides that, cost, but I mean, there well, is a point of diminishing returns. You can you use, you yeah. could say you add, you stack 10 of these in there. It must be great, right? Well, uh, and that comes back to the, like, if you're calculating inductance, two pi squared L, you know, so it's very much a square law type of deal, you mm -hmm. know, so as you double the, or multiply the ferrite, the inductance by four, you only double the protection and, and that keeps going like that. So uh, absolutely, uh, John Van Milligan mentions he wishes we had ferrites that would just fit over an XLR connector. And John, going to send you to that Amadon website again, uh, because they will, again, different materials, different sizes. Uh, remember, we provide the ones for the stuff that we use the most. But uh, yeah, absolutely, for custom stuff like that or, or any special requirements, they are an excellent resource. And no, they don't have me on commission yet. I'm looking at my wall of stuff here, and I know I just bought some. Uh, the the little best things that I've gotten ever, you can get them on Amazon, is the clip-on beads. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, just like you see on like a monitor cable or, you know, sometimes an audio cable. You can get those little clip-ons. Yeah. I get a four-pack for nine bucks. Just buy 50 bucks worth of them and throw them in your toolbox. You're going to use them uh, right. because they are the little problem solver. Yep. And uh, they're really handy. Well, as you say, for uh, cat or for uh, network cable, um, for audio cable, anything like that. Remote lines, uh, especially, because a lot of guys are using multi-pair Cat five or Cat six nowadays mm -hmm. as their remote lines. Yep. Technically, they should have their own common mode rejection. But guess what happens when you throw them in a fifty kilowatt transmitter? Yep. They 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 hold that they hold that pretty well. So take the right. edge off of them. Now, David asks if it's best to run uh, all three conductors through one ferrite or better to use three ferrites. And the short answer is number one, there's four conductors if we're talking three phase, because three phase is plus the ground. Um, but it, the answer is kind of a qualified, it depends. Uh, on our Q series transmitters, they have a non ground reference balanced floating power supply. So plus and minus outputs, no ground. On those ones, you would put each conductor, the AC feed, that in that case, three phase, each mm -hmm. conductor would go through its own ferrite to, to create chokes. Um, normally, because we want to go for common mode protection, all the conductors, all the feeds, plus the ground return would go through a single choke. And if yep. you can loop it around and feed it again, that's even better. Yep. So uh, let's say a, a quantified or a little bit of a, a qualified uh, situation but mm -hmm. but yeah, definitely uh, look at the uh, look at your own scenario. Um, okay, and John's uh, giving me grief about those. Uh, okay, custom ferrites for John. I'll add it to the wish list. Uh, I got a so I got a question from that on the uh, in the customer service queue the other day. As a guy was asking me if we had made split uh, ferrites big enough to go around three inch hard line. Yep because he and, didn't want to take unassemble the connector and stuff like that, which I can't blame him. He wants to add to his sites that he's already got pre-existing. Right. So the short answer to that, you get the four and a quarter inch inside diameter ones. And Rich Parker with uh, with um, Alaska Public Media in, in Juneau, and I may have got the company wrong. Sorry, Rich. I know he's not Coast on, Alaska. but if he watches the archive. What's that? Coast Alaska. Coast Alaska. Thank you. Uh, Rich has done some actual scientific experimentation on this, took a, uh, a diamond coping saw, cut a, a big ferrite in half, um, tried to epoxy it, wrapped some wire through it, measured the inductance, and then took it apart and uh, JB welded it together, you know, the, the uh, metal filled epoxy that J, uh, JB weld. And, uh, 
and then wrapped it again and measured it and found that he had much closer to the original inductance with the JB weld. So the short answer is you can cut a big ferrite with a diamond coping saw. You can bond it back together, but use JB weld or something uh, fairly conductive in the process of uh, rebonding it. So there you go. That was uh, today's subtle little tip. Um, flipping ahead. Let's see, surge protector, surge protector. Absolutely. Have we mentioned that uh, surge protectors should not be optional? Yep. Um, and the reason for this, most sites, as I say, are built in a less than ideal situation. AC comes in from the street side, antennas in the backfield, transmitters in the middle, and all the current goes through everything. And that is what we try to accommodate. That's a terrible picture. Someday I'll redraw it. But uh, today is not that day. Uh, one of the things you can do is reroute the coax. Now, coax is not inexpensive. We all know this. Coax is very expensive. So some of the other options, you might run the coax straight back and uh, run a ground strap from your reference ground back to the coax shield. Um, keeping in mind that uh, the ground strap will have a lower resistance per foot than the coax shield, especially if it's corrugated, typically. Mm -hmm. So again, it's situational. You deal with what you've got to work with. Um, Alex, what's one of the favorite things you have for uh, optimizing a site when you walk into one that's a little less than ideal? Uh, first and foremost is uh, one that I just recently went to was uh, the one I can't stress the most is, yes, yeah, the transmitter's expensive, the feed line's expensive, you know, the, the, the sample port you put in there from Bird or whoever, that's expensive. Why are y'all hanging it with chain? Uh, <laughs> it, yeah. The stuff vibrates. Uh, you're just going to rub through there and you're going to expose that, uh, expose the, the, the copper outer using chain. I mean, yeah. I've seen, or or cable, bicycle cable, uh, you mm -hmm. know, or dog leash line. I've even seen, you know, mm -hmm. don't do that. Get the proper hangers. They're like five bucks in the grand scheme of things. It's cheap. Yeah. Um, do it right. Um, that that's what we're here to do is make sure that you do it right. Other thing to look for is the the goal is, and Jeff has shown a lot of pictures here of bus bars inside the building. I don't like them inside. Don't bring the lightning inside. I rather yeah. keep them outside. Um, so as your gland panel comes into the building, as your coaxes come in, the ground should be right there, right below the yeah. gland panel. Should be. Quantify I don't want to that. bring it inside. You've still got a surge protector inside, so it's coming inside yeah. anyway, but that's, uh, right. that's a different argument. Right. Um, so Michael asks, why are ferrites necessary on lower power transmitter transmission lines to eliminate spurious? And, and no, the answer is, is very much, again, so the purpose of the ferrite here, uh, the, any surge comes in. So if surge hits the tower, uh, what's going to happen is that energy is going to hit the base of the tower. Ground potential is because ground has a specific resistance per foot that there's going to be a voltage developed down there. If that voltage exceeds the AC line voltage by the clamp level of the surge protector, the surge protector will clamp and decouple you out to the AC lines and your surge goes away from the site. The purpose of the ferrite is to raise the effective impedance of the equipment being protected so that, again, we're looking at a voltage divider. The, the surge can go through the AC lines by way of the surge protector or it can go through the power supplies in the transmitter and out the AC lines that way. And anything we can do to make the transmitter look like a higher impedance means less energy goes that way and more goes the other way. Well, if you look at Jeff's horrible picture here, you can see exactly that. The transmitter sits dead center. Now, now Kevin's saying he loves that picture, but uh, Kevin, so <laughs> Kevin Rogers, for anybody who doesn't know him, Kevin Rogers is our CEO, uh, owner of the company. And uh, a million years ago, when I got hired at Nautel, he was our customer service manager. I'm not sure he may have drawn that picture, so <laughs> we won't call him out on it too much. Actually, but, I may have drawn I can't remember who drew it. It's been a while. But, but, but uh, still, you can see very uh, plain as day, the transmitter's directly in the center. You got your coax going out to your antenna and up the tower, and you got your AC lines coming in the middle. The two yeah. common things there, you got ferrites on both sides because you're trying to keep that potential difference you know, if it's going to go this way, make it go that way from either yeah. side. Because tower, when lightning strikes the tower, is interspersible with lightning hits your thousand foot stick versus the seventy foot 
AC line pull out in the yard. Right. Well, and that's, and, the, but that's an argument I have made many, many times. I think that you will find that the bulk of the time at a transmitter facility, when you see all these little wall warts and switch and supplies melting down, it's not because of an AC problem. It's because of a tower strike that yeah. was trying to find a way out to the millions of miles of power line and all those switching supplies were the way to do it. So, so you, had re you had reminded me too, since we're 10 minutes past the top of the hour already, <laughs> quarter wave sh uh, stubs. Uh, that is very good because thank you for bringing that up. So quarter wave stubs, uh, we had two people in the advance ask about them because we do on occasion for higher power boxes, 15 kilowatts and up say, you really should have that. Uh, little secret, I'll let you know why, because one antenna company in, and, and in their defense, it's a wonderful idea. It's a great system. They put a shorting stub on their antenna. Other companies, they provide them as options and almost nobody ever takes it up. But uh, when they put the shorting stub on the antenna, when you get a strike on the tower, you've got the ability to transform all that energy because of course the shorting stub at the antenna does what it's supposed to do. So all that energy comes down, hits the output of the transmitter. And at the, and this is my theory, we haven't proven this at all. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt because this is just me looking at, uh, you know, what do they say causation or correlation does not imply causation. But if I see the exact same problem happen at seven different sites and all of them have the same antenna, then I start to uh, draw some parallels. Anyway, it's kind of also the definition of insanity. So take it right. whichever way you want. <laughs> well, I've been in radio for 30 plus years. Insane is not implied anymore. It's just a given. But <laughs> right. uh, anyway, so in this particular situation, because we use in the NV and VLT and GV series transmitters, hybrid combining, the amplifiers are all at a different phase angle relative to the output connector. And when you hit the seven or the 15 kilowatt and higher, one amplifier in particular is electrically at the output of the transmitter. So a shorting stub at the output of the transmitter will save that uh, particular amplifier in a situation where you're transforming a bunch of energy down the coax from the antenna with its own shorting stub. And yep. That's why I bring it up because it's only been that one. And somebody asked why we don't include them with the new transmitters. And that's the reason because there's only one brand where it's an issue. And, uh, you know, you're adding a fair bit of cost to the price of the product for, uh, for you know, a not every situation scenario. All right. Um, Oh, one other comment, Alex, and you may be able yeah. to help with this because I cannot. Uh, sure. Somebody mentioned gas tubes, and I know that Polyphaser used to make them for a kilowatt and less. I don't know if they yep. still do. You can get uh, the the little ones with the end connectors, and they make a DIN one now, uh, which I recommend. You know, for cheap insurance, I carry a, a pack of them. They're like mm -hmm. fifty bucks for the DIN ones, uh, for yep. the seven sixteen DINs. Uh, mm -hmm for uh vs ones they're they're great for that same with the uh, vs 300s the end style uh yep. better than nothing factor um and, and yes they have the screw on the side you take your 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 ground line what i do is i just screw it right to the bus bar usually uh, mm -hmm. and that right as as the point of entry exit for the antenna line with some no locks with some no locks um <laughs> on both sides uh so they will still do exist um there's a handful of other ones that are out there. Are any of them better than the polyphaser? Don't know. Um, never had to replace one yet. Uh, this is a relatively new thing for me to start doing. I mean, within the past couple of years, um, yeah. as they the advantage to gas tubes is they have a very fixed firing voltage. Mm -hmm. um, now, the disadvantage to gas tubes is if you take your little transmitter that they're connected to and convert it to HD where you're adding more peak voltage as the HD carriers are amplitude they modulated, yeah. you could potentially exceed the firing voltage. So that is something else to be aware of as well. Not potentially, you certainly will. <laughs> I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go, the voice of experience. Um, David McKenzie asks on a smaller transmission line, how about a loop before it enters the building? And again, it's not bad insurance. Uh, quantify it, uh, make sure the loop goes the right direction because if Correct. it goes down instead of up, 
it's a drip loop. If it goes up, it's a way for water to run right down the coax into the building. Yep. For like a cat five, cat six, seven things running up the tower, what I like to do, because the, the cable is so you know, pliable, right mm -hmm. at the entrance to the radio, make your loop there. No, no less than three turns into the radio and at the bottom of the tower, just the same, because you can get struck in the middle of the tower. You know, yep. it doesn't always go to the top. Right. Uh, so, you know, at the bottom of the tower, do three loops before it goes into the building, three loops as it goes into the radio for all right. your small wiring. Like somebody asked once why I growl so hard about wanting ground kits installed where the coax comes into the building. And the big reason is because I've worked with a lot of tower climbers over the last 30 odd years. And I haven't seen a whole lot of them do a lot of uh, scraping of paint when they're attaching a ground kit to a coax going up a tower. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those ground kits going up the coax are nice, but from a lightning protections perspective, they'll save the coax. And right. ultimately, I think that's what they're really geared to do. Again, but, one of those things that's cheap insurance, you know, for if you rent your tower or own your tower, it doesn't matter. What I do is I have a couple of cans of cold galve that's always sitting out there. Uh, mm -hmm. So when the tower guys do come, you know, first thing I do is if they're doing anything grounding, I hand them the can of cold galve or I'll pick up a fresh bottle on my way out because 99% of the time they won't. Yep. And, you know, here's your wire brush. Here's your cold galve. Put your clamp on because they're, they're, they're counting for the teeth on the clamp mm -hmm. getting biting through the paint. That doesn't right. always work, especially if you've got a really old tower that's got 40 coats of paint on it. Yeah, about a quarter of inch of paint. Right, exactly. Yeah. So you really need to drill at home it's like guys i'll pay you the extra few bucks here's what you're doing yeah now um, before we get any further i'd mentioned earlier some resources uh here's a couple if anybody wants to grab a screenshot uh and again this will be archived so you can always come back to it later um the ferrite one is a great article on uh, how they determine what goes into them the uh, texas instrument one is more about uh ferrite composition um, a Wikipedia on permeability that was actually pretty entertaining, and then a Nuts and Volts magazine, a good article on ferrites in general from uh, from a, a ham perspective. So uh, definitely, you know, feel free to grab those. One other question that uh, Dave Richards had asked, and it, it's a good one, and I meant to get to it earlier. If you've got a transmitter in the basement below grade, do you ground to the top or the bottom of the rack? <laughs> uh, so, again, a big fat depends. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'll quantify it by saying that historically, the uh, the model we always used to follow was cable high, ground high. So, you know, if your AC is running in the top, your ground should be in the top. If you're running any of our bigger boxes, the non-rack mount units, you'll look at that insulated ground at the back at the bottom. If you look inside, that insulated ground goes to two two-gauge wires. And those two two-gauge wires go directly up to the output connector. So you know, grounding high and going to the output connector will just save you six feet of uh, two gauge wire times two. Yep. So, Easy enough there. Yeah. Top or bottom, take your pick. Right. So, you just know, make sure my if preference... you're going up to the top, make sure that you're getting a nice mechanical connection. Right. The only so, thing I will say is it's a little bit more difficult to slide a four inch copper strap underneath one of the bolts right next to an output connector. <laughs> I, you know, so I've seen a lot where they were uh, cut into this nice little semicircle and put on with a with a molded uh, clamp on top. A four inch hole saw will get you everywhere you need to go here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well then you want six inch strap. Well, I suppose you could do a, a nice semicircle that way. Exactly. So uh, we have hit 20 minutes past the top of the hour. I think this is a record for going over time. Uh, definitely one of my records. Uh, it's not an easy subject with, to cover in an hour. Well, it's a whole lot of fun. So mm -hmm. as with everything we do, this uh, webinar will be archived as uh, will on both our YouTube channel and you can link to it from the uh, resources tab on our website. Uh, the Waves newsletter, I think Fiona said there's, I can't remember what there's, I think there's one coming out shortly. Uh, so look for that. Uh, somebody who looks a lot like me writes a tips article in there and I try not to be too annoying about it. On that note, Alex, I want to thank you for spending the last hour and a half plus with us as we get into prep time. And I want to thank everybody who attended for spending that much time with us today. It was a great session and we really appreciate your time. Thank you and have a great day.